Good morning, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Cole Nishikawa, who will be giving grand rounds uh, this morning. Uh, Cole hails from the town of uh, Pukalani, which is in the foothills of uh, Haleakala on the island of Maui. He went to uh, King uh, Kekalike High School and then went to University of Hawaii for both undergraduate and medical school. He actually was first um, exposed to vascular surgery as a medical student by a friend of his who's a medical student two years ahead of him, Nate Toga, who just by chance happened to have been one of my mentees at Stanford. And Nate told him to spend a rotation with Peter Schneider, who um, was a former UCSF uh, person and was a very um, um, stalwart vascular surgeon in the Kaiser system uh, in Hawaii and also a national leader in, in many of the advances that we have done in PAD. He matched here at, uh, at Davis and he spent uh, the last uh, five years here um, on the mainland, um, but not to be swayed. He is planning on uh, returning to his homeland of Hawaii uh, uh, when, he, when he finishes. He'll be working uh, in two hospitals at, at Straub and at uh, Polymomi, and uh, also in an outpatient center in a, in a private vascular setting, the Pacific Vascular Institute. So this morning he's going to talk to us about the autonomy crisis balance between resident autonomy and patient safety. So please welcome uh, Cole Nishikawa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dr. Mel and the Department of Surgery for allowing me to present uh, my grand rounds. Uh, I'll be talking about the resident autonomy crisis. Um, most surgeons would agree that a core objective in surgical training is development of autonomy. However, reaching a consensus on how to practically and effectively implement this goal in the new environment of patient safety, duty hour restrictions, and medical legal barriers makes this goal a work in progress. So goals and objectives. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the educational theories behind resident autonomy. We're going to review the current state of resident autonomy, and then we're going to discuss innovations on how to improve autonomy. And lastly, we'll uh, discuss uh, the future of resident autonomy. So let's dive into the definition. Autonomy comes from the Greek origin of autos, meaning self, and nomos, meaning law. Together, it becomes autonomos, meaning having its own laws. In the 17th century, it became uh, known as autonomy, which is the drive to be the origin of one's behavior and to exercise free will in choosing one's goals. So why is autonomy so important? Autonomy is actually one of the three pillars of the self-determination theory. And these core components determine a person's intrinsic motivation. By accomplishing these three components, you can produce a happy and motivated surgeon. The second component of this theory is competence, which is the need to feel efficacious in, one's, in the actions one performs. This requires some form of evaluation on performance. The last component is relatedness. This is the desire to feel connected with others and valued by one's community. This is another topic where medical training has focused its efforts on improving, with efforts to increase resident wellness and prevention of burnout. But the focus for today will be on autonomy and how it is part of the big picture in the self-determination theory. So there's a lot of literature on the benefits of resident autonomy. It has been shown to improve motivation, learning and retention, satisfaction and happiness, and achievement. Autonomy is crucial, not only because it prepares residents for a future successful and independent practice, but it also instills a sense of ownership in patient care, enhances confidence, and fosters clinical competence during training. As stated in the self-determination theory, the effects of autonomy are mediated in part through intrinsic motivation. This is enhanced by autonomy supportive context, for example, just knowing that one's operative plan will actually be implemented tends to focus the learner's attention in a way that passive participation will not. Furthermore, seeing the consequences of one's actions not only improves learning, but cultivates 
a sense of purpose, commitment, and responsibility. These are the same attributes that are sometimes identified as lacking in our recent graduates. And reductions in resident autonomy are unlikely to improve the situation. The unintended consequences of decreased autonomy extends into professional development, especially in leadership and teaching skills. Many advanced skills can only be practiced when a resident is allowed to direct an operation. For example, residents must practice how to set up an optimal exposure, work with an assistant, and effectively communicate with the anesthesia team. Without rehearsal, expertise is not possible. In this way, residents may be functioning as highly skilled and capable first assistants, but not surgeons. In addition, despite the relatively stable number of case volumes seen among chief residents, the number of reported teaching assistant cases, where the residents are able to practice leadership and teaching skills in the OR, has steadily declined. This will also have an impact on resident well-being, as trainees surveyed about contributing factors leading to burnout often cite decreased autonomy. Lastly, progressive autonomy is important because residents should be expected to demonstrate readiness for independent practice before graduation. A supervised transition from residency to independent practice should be a smooth curve of progressively less guidance. But in reality, this transition can be very abrupt. And this may explain why many trainees lack confidence that they will be competent by the time they graduate. This is shown in national surveys where residents and faculty both agree that the residents are now graduating from programs with far less autonomy uh, than in the past. Thus, it is not surprising that there has been an increasingly uh, more residents that are now pursuing fellowships or additional training after surgical residency. In orthopedic surgery, many residents complete two fellowships. Uh, this has made training longer and longer. The main fear is that one of the reasons behind prolonged training is that residents do not feel ready to enter practice. But when we talk about resident autonomy, this is what happens. There's a divide between the residents and attendings. You can even see it here during our grand round presentations. You have the attendings on this side and the residents on this side. The picture here is a little deceiving in that it implies that the back and forth is equal. But let's pretend the middle represents who holds the Mets during the surgery. What's missing in this picture is power. There is a constant struggle between the resident and attending, but it is ultimately up to the attending's discretion on how much autonomy the resident gets. A better representation would be this. The attending surgeon with the power has to constantly determine how much power how much autonomy to give the resident. They must utilize their best judgment about when a resident has demonstrated the appropriate trustworthiness, level of awareness of his or her limitations, and the adequate competence to be given the autonomy to perform any uh, patient care task. Meanwhile, the resident is trying to take as much autonomy as possible. Of course, there are also concerns that too much autonomy may lead to medical errors and poor patient outcomes. The widely publicized death of Libby Zion in 1984 highlighted the connection between resident supervision and autonomy with medical errors. The unfortunate death led to a serious re-evaluation of residency structure on a national scale. As a result, there has been implementation of legislative policies that have had a profound and detrimental impact on resident autonomy. These laws put pressure on attending surgeons to expedite operative time. Uh, they require attending surgeons' presence during the critical portions of the operation, and they have restricted duty hours. This has limited intraoperative and clinical opportunities for resident involvement. Particularly in surgery, there are many factors that have contributed to the decrease in uh, resident autonomy. There are many new procedures. There's open surgery, laparoscopic, robotic, endoscopic, endovascular, and hybrid procedures. There are new techniques being developed all the time. There's also the fear of litigation and the public's opinion on resident involvement during procedures. 
the patients are also increasingly complex. The typical vascular patient has end-stage renal failure, heart failure, poorly controlled diabetes. They've been smoking since they were 12. They now have an enlarging paravisceral aortic aneurysm. Then, then they're also on a blood thinner for AFib, and they have a history of venous thromboembolism. And finally, we have the loss of index procedures. We're not doing the traditional procedures of the past. Open aortic surgery, open abdominal surgery. These are being replaced by more minimally invasive procedures and medications. Even trauma has become managed more and more non-operatively. And all these factors have created an environment where we have seen a resident autonomy decrease. Now we can see how autonomy has started to decrease even before we start our residency. Over the years, there has been a gradual erosion of medical student autonomy. Medical students are less and less able to write notes, orders, or participate in procedures. Sometimes they're asked to leave the room by the patient. We have seen medical students transition from learners to tourists. So I remember when I was still a fourth year medical student, I did my fourth year rotation uh, sub I here at UC Davis on the vascular surgery service. Uh, I was assisting the fellow, Vu, uh, with an angiogram. Dr. Pevic peeks his head in the doorway and motioned for me to come with him. The cath lab had given us a second room and we were going to perform an angiogram on one of our inpatients. It was just me and Dr. Pevic. The patient was already draped and he asked if I've ever gotten access. In my head, I thought, I've done one, if I include this case. <laughs> At this point in the rotation, I've seen a dozen uh, femoral access, and I've done a few central lines uh, as a medical student. So he took the ultrasound and showed me exactly where he wanted me to puncture. So I took the micropuncture needle. Where's your needle tip, Cole? I nervously advance until I see it. Go, go, go. I got access, we placed the sheath. He hands me the J-wire, and of course, I couldn't form it without the cheater. Stop, switch places with me. He took the wire, and I assisted him for the rest of the case. It was still an exhilarating experience, but one that will happen infrequently as a medical student. So how much autonomy does an attending give a resident? What are the benchmarks to assess when residents are ready for autonomy in the operating room? This is a 2017 study from the Journal of Surgical Education that looked at assessing resident readiness in the OR. They used the PICS questionnaire. So the PICS questionnaire is a five topic assessment that determines how much autonomy to allow a resident. It looks at performance. Do I feel comfortable with the resident's technical performance and skills? Impression. What is my perception of this resident? Does the resident have a good reputation? Did they meet my expectations in the last case? Characteristics. What is the resident's training level? Have they performed this surgery before? Are they prepared for the case? Knowledge. Did the resident come up with a reasonable operative plan? Do they know my patient? Do they understand the pitfalls of the procedure? And lastly, situation. How is the day going? Do we need to speed up the case? How complex is this patient? And all of these factors go into determining how much autonomy a resident will be given throughout the procedure. This is another paper from the PLS Collaborative, which focused on readiness of general surgery residents uh, for independent practice. 14 general surgery programs participated with over 500 residents and over 10,000 simple evaluations. Simple stands for System for Improvement and Measuring uh, pr Procedural Learning. This is a software platform that facilitates intraoperative resident evaluation. This assessment consists of three questions, uh, the resident and attending answer on the performance of a resident uh, during an operation. The target goal is to have chief residents score supervision only 
and practice ready performance by the end of their surgical training. Uh, this would mean that they are ready for independent practice. So this study showed that only 33% of residents, chief residents in the last six months of training received supervision only in some of the core surgery, surgery procedures, including cholecystectomy, hernia repair, appendectomy, and partial colectomy. The simple questionnaire uses the Zweish scale. This is a four level scale that can be used to measure progression of resident autonomy in the OR. This rates the operative autonomy based on the level of assistance that is required. There's show and tell, where the resident observes and assists. There's active help, where the resident actively assists and performs the non-critical steps of the performance. There's passive help, where the resident controls the flow of the case, anticipates the next step and the critical steps with minimal um, assistance from the attending. And lastly, supervision only, where the resident performs the operation uh, by themselves or uh, with a junior resident. And chief residents should be able to perform supervision only for all the core surgical procedures prior to graduation. And this tool al also offers residents a, a reliable rating across evaluators and has been shown to correlate with postgraduate year. Another model the BID, or Briefing, Intraoperative Teaching, and Debriefing model is another tool for surgeons to assess the level of resident readiness. This was introduced by Roberts and colleagues in 2009 to fit with an attending uh, surgeon's current practice. This model takes advantage of teaching moments that occur before, during, and at the end of any operation. The briefing is a short interaction that typically takes place at the scrub sink. This serves to assess the resident's knowledge level and preparation for the case, as well as establishing objectives for the procedure based on the resident's experience. The focus of intraoperative teaching is to guide the resident through the procedure while emphasizing the learning points that were discussed in the briefing. And then debriefing occurs during incision closure or after the completion of the case. It focuses on reflection, rules, reinforcement, and corrections. It allows residents time to reflect on their performance and attendings to provide valuable feedback. Now, there are many other aspects that play into determining the operative autonomy. This is a 2014 survey of surgical attendings that was published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons. And this showed the factors that increased resident autonomy where the residents observed clinical skills and the attendings a level of confidence with that operation. The things that ne negatively impacted resident autonomy are the increased focus on patient outcomes, the desire to increase OR efficiency, and the expectation of surgeon involvement by the patient or the hospital. And this can be very challenging for the residents because many of these factors of our, are out of our control. And this difficulty can be amplified if there is unfamiliarity between the resident and the faculty member. Another aspect that makes implementing resident autonomy difficult is that there are currently no valid or reliable assessment tools for evalu evaluating resident performance in real time in the operating room. So many times we end up just seeing how it goes. And this inability to assess residents is a patient care problem and can directly affect resident autonomy. Now, there are innumerable studies that detail the outcomes of surgical procedures with resident involvement. Many of these use large databases to assess this, which as you all know is very difficult. There are so many co-variables to account for. But when you look at all the data combined, most studies, the majority of them, uh, show that mortality is equivalent whether there are in residents involved in the case or not. Some studies actually show a decrease in mortality. But in general, complication rates, including SSIs, and OR time seem to be a little bit higher. But again, it is difficult to assess 
what the level of resident involvement is in these large database studies. Now we, can, oh, sorry. now we can talk about the patient perspective. A paper from the Journal of Surgical Education in 2015 surveyed patients in order to understand if the general population could appreciate the difference between a resident and a, an attending surgeon. So 96% of the population welcomed resident involvement in their overall hospital care. But when it came down to performing a basic procedure, this dropped down to 82%. And when it involved a complex procedure, it dropped down even more to 59%. And as we all know, in an academic institution, this is exactly the opposite trend. The more complex a procedure, the more likely a resident or fellow will be involved in the case. They then asked the patients a different question. If they needed a routine procedure, would they consent to a chief resident? And they then defined the chief resident as someone who had at least four years of college, four years of medical school training, and at least five years of uh, surgical training, performing your operation independently. Now, how many people think it was 25%, 50%, 75%, 73%. So it turns out if you actually explain what a chief resident is, what kind of training they went through, the acceptance rate is much higher. And many of the general population do not understand the difference between an attending surgeon and a resident unless they watch Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Luckily here at UC Davis we have the white and green badge designations to tell us apart. Now they also asked, if you did have surgery, would you want to know how much is going to be done by the resident? And 61% of their responses were yes. So in general, most people want to know how much is going to be performed by the resident. So the next question, what can we do to increase resident autonomy? We have seen graduating residents over the past decade performing 20 to 25% fewer cases with a decrease in operative confidence observed by fellowship program directors. Many programs are now incorporating simulation-based skills early in training to counteract this trend. Simulation with open, endovascular, laparoscopic, and endoscopic surgery has allowed residents to gain confidence and increase skill and autonomy in the operating room. Many studies have shown an increase in perceived confidence and competence following completion of a simulation course. But what about a structured operative autonomy as part of the educational curriculum? So MGH did a pilot run for a chief resident service in order to determine if a structured autonomy would increase resident education without impacting patient outcomes. So they created a four week rotation where graduating chief residents were paired with a third year resident. Patients were admitted to this service either from faculty elective practices, if they felt that this patient would be suitable for this service, or through inpatient or ED consultations. The service also admitted non-operative patients as well as readmissions of patients who were previously on the service. They actually got two days of block time in the OR, and urgent and emergent surgeries could be added on any day of the week. <laughs> The chief resident would be operating independently or with the R3, and the attending would be scrubbed to supervise only the critical portions of the procedure. And before each case, the attending would specify what exactly those critical portions of the procedure would be. The patients would then be admitted to this service post-operatively, where the chief would make the daily plans and then run them by the attending. The attending would lay it around on the patients on their own discretion. So they did this as a controlled cohort study, which was matched by attending and procedure. They looked at the three most common surgeries that were performed on their, this chief service, and that was laparoscopic appendectomy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and open cholecystectomy. They looked at the three, oh sorry, the primary endpoint was 30-day post-op complications, the 30-day readmission rate, 
and 30-day procedure um, related ED visits. So as you can see, the patient demographics here show that the two groups were relatively similar. However, the structured autonomy group of patients were more likely to be non-elective. And that's because they had to go and find their own patients through inpatients and ED consults. Table four shows the primary outcome, which was 30-day complications, readmissions, and ED visits. And these were similar among the two groups. Table five shows that the only things that were statistically significant between the resident and attending groups were an increased length of hospital stay and operative room duration. And this difference ended up being less than a day for the entire hospital stay and about 22 minutes longer in the operating room. And now the R3s on the service also participated in a resident minor procedure clinic. This was run at the same time at the attendings clinic where supervision could occur. And this was to use the same procedure room so that there were no other uh, co-variables um, that could account for any discrepancy. The attending would see the patient and explain that the resident would be performing the procedure independently. So here again, table one shows the residents performed over 100 cases. Uh, the demographics were about the same again, but in the resident group, the comorbidity severity index was a little bit higher. And as you can see, the residents performed more soft tissue mass excisions and less abscess drainages, probably because they're more fun to do. Now looking at the complications, you can see there's no significant difference between the resident and attending groups, uh, unadjusted. And even uh, when you adjust for all the co-variables, there was still no difference. So the patient outcomes were the same. They also performed a questionnaire this was to assess if there was a difference perceived in the actual care delivered. For example, maybe the complication rates are the same, but in the resident procedure room, the patients were in excruciating pain. They gave out a modified SCAP survey and had the patients fill it out after the procedure. And as you can see, there was no difference in the overall ratings of care given by the patients who had the procedures done by the resident or by the attending surgeon. And on adjusted analysis, resident care did not independently impact the likelihood of a best possible care rating uh, for overall quality of care. So what were the main takeaways from this MGH study? It was mentioned that the residents overwhelmingly supported this rotation, citing that increased operative autonomy as the greatest strength. The survey, surgery program felt that structured autonomy enhances resident education, and for the chief residents, eases their transition to practice. And this did not affect patient outcomes. They felt that programs should incorporate structured autonomy during residency training, and that the key to incorporating resident autonomy starts with entrustment. The attending surgeons must be able to trust the residents. And the most powerful tool for residents to gain trust with their attendings is with open communication. Studies have shown that residents who discuss the operations before the day of surgery have more autonomy during the case. And as a resident, this makes sense. If I discuss the procedure with the attendings, if I designate the steps of the operation, anticipate the pitfalls, and allocate which steps I'd like to focus on during the procedure, the attending is much more likely to allow me to perform that part of the operation. So what are we doing at UC Davis in terms of evaluating resident autonomy? Dr. Humphreys has been developing an assessment tool in the MedHub app where residents can initiate a self-evaluation. We already use the MedHub app to show competency in certain bedside procedures like central lines, chest tubes, uh, abscess drainages. Um, and right now it's being built into the iPhone app uh, for easy access. Simply click the Evaluations tab here at the bottom of, of the app. And so the questions uh, in this app are similar to the simple questionnaire that we discussed earlier. There's a modifier that 
shows how difficult the case was. So easier, average, or more difficult than other cases. It also uses the Zweish model for how much guidance was provided by the attending. Again, supervision only was the goal for uh, chief residents before graduating. And then they have the attendings uh, score the resident uh, based on their performance for the case. So unprepared, inexperienced but knowledgeable, minor deficiencies, and then independent performance. Lastly, there's an area for comments where specific feedback can be given for any case. This evaluation would only take a few minutes to fill out and is easily accessible by phone. This could also be used to track resident performance in the core surgeries uh, throughout the residency. Because the MedHub app that is in development uses a four-point scale, it correlates well with the ACGME uh, surgery milestone project. The milestone project was designed to assess the development of resident uh, physician uh, key dimensions of the elements in physician competency. This includes knowledge, skills, and attitudes, as well as other attributes uh, for the AHCGME competencies. They show targets for performance as a resident moves through residency through to graduation. For the operations and procedures, there are four levels, and the uh, level four represents the graduation target performance level. So this would correlate well uh, with our MedHub app. So now that we're in the future, or beta stages, sorry, of this app development, what are some of the ways that we can implement this into our UC Davis curriculum? Dr. Humphreys and I talked about a few ideas. One of them would be to randomly select residents and attendings to complete the procedure evaluations and see if the views of autonomy during the case correlate between the resident and attending. This way we can see if any discrepancies could be further investigated and help to bridge the gap between the perceptions of autonomy between both groups. There would also be times where the resident can ask the attending specifically for an evaluation after any procedure if they felt that it went well. And this would allow residents to get much valued feedback and insight into their own procedural skills and preparedness. We can then use this data to show longitudinal progression of resident autonomy from intern year all the way to graduation. And in this way, we could also incorporate the ACGM, ACGME milestones and have the goal of residents operating with supervision only for various procedures based on their postgraduate year. The Vassier Milestone project broke, it, broke down some of the core surgeries into basic, intermediate, and advanced, and that's something that we can do for each PGY level year. Uh, that way we can have um, time points for, for goals of each uh, resident. So in summary, resident autonomy is a crucial aspect of surgical education. There are many competing perspectives and different assessment tools on autonomy. And we now know that there's a way to incorporate structured autonomy, which has comparable patient outcomes. But this requires a lot of planning, open communication, but will allow balance between the power differential of attendings and residents. So what can the resident do in the future to increase the likelihood for having autonomy in the operating room? I think the first thing is to divide the steps into operations. Then discuss those steps with the attending prior to the operation and not at the scrub sink. This way we can establish specific goals and expectations on which steps we would like to focus on. This might be the best way to avoid the awkward moment where I try to steal the Mets away from Dr. Mel. And finally, always reflect on the operation and ask for feedback. I'd like to thank the Department of Surgery and the Division of Vascular Surgery for allowing me to present my grand rounds. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Cole, that was great. Thank you very much. And you know, as you know, we kind of talked about this um, 
dinner at my house uh, yes. over the weekend that this was a big issue on the minds of all the graduating chief residents. Mm -hmm. I think you really not only describe the problem, but were able to identify potential solutions too. That's a great technique for success in the future. Yes. Um, we have some time for questions. This is really an important topic, so I'd like to open it up. Great, Cole. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Um, you 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 showed a lot of different assessment tools, and you know, as you know, I struggle personally with some of these assessment tools in terms of how to you know which of them, if any, provides the best feedback for residents. Can you and can you comment on some of the tools that you've? that you both spoke about and that we've used here at Davis and where you think some of the strengths and weaknesses of the assessment tools are? I don't think we've actually used any of these at UC Davis, but I think the best one would be the simple app or the ones that we are developing in the MedHub app. Um, the strengths would be that it takes only a few minutes to fill out that, that app because there's only three questions. Um, and that way we can track the data of yourself with all the attendings throughout your uh, residency training. But the downside, I think, is that each attending, if they have three of those, you know, three of those from each resident, then all of a sudden they have 150 of these, and I don't think that they're going <coughs> to want to do those. Dr. Humphreys, we can repeat the question too, after. There's a microphone right here, so there's microphones all over the room, actually. Um, so I, I developed this because last year when we went through our AC Jimmy surveys, one of the areas that we repeatedly have been getting dinged on for the last few years is resident evaluations, both sides. And so we made it an initiative. Um, the, the evaluation is actually, for, for the program directors in here, is in vascular, but Juanita can give you access to it if you want to use it in your different programs. Um, it's an interesting concept, this idea of giving them independent autonomy. And in our milestones in vascular, it is unique that we have these procedures that, that Cole mentioned, basic procedures, um, intermediate and advanced. And it goes through and says, you know, to get to a level four, you should be able to do an angiogram. Well, that's something I think of as a PGY two or three being able to do. So could we do that assessment? I don't really know if this app is, or this evaluation that we created is gonna work for our team or for our place, but I figured we could at least try it. And, and we could see what kind of buy-in we get, get from the faculty, get from the residents, and see what it, it means. But I think we do need to continue to evolve some of the things that we do in terms of education, because we haven't quite pinpointed what the best method is yet. So we might need to do some experimentation for a little while. So, uh, as being one of the people that was involved with most of the, I was a resident for most of these studies, um, because Jane Dennington and people who were my chairs, because I was a resident and they were some of the lead authors on these studies. It, I think that you highlighted a lot of the things that residents can do that help themselves. The other thing that I would suggest is something that's not highlighted in these studies is spending time in the even when you're not stressed, learning and getting to know the faculty so that they do know you and um, are able to give you that autonomy as you grow. Um, and I think you did a really good job of highlighting a lot of things that we can do better um, to help the Thank you. So uh, I, I'm going to make a comment about the MGH uh, studies, and maybe maybe because you did your residency there too. So maybe you can. So it what goes around comes around. When I was a medical student, there was a minor surgery clinic that was run by residents and medical students, and we got to do cases as medical students. And there were two resident-run services where they had the super chiefs, the West and the East, and they were they were disbanded at some point in time. Maybe you know more more of that information, but. It's very interesting to see that sort of what what go, what goes around comes around, and I think people recognize that that at least at, at MGH that those um, 
that those autonomous experiences were really quite valuable. When I was actually um, a student on the West Service, my super chief was uh, Dave Ratner, and my senior resident was Scott Adzik. And so it was a very interesting experience watching them basically do uh, cases with very, with very little uh, uh, attending uh, 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 input. My question, my question for you, though, about the um, um, previewing the cases. I think that's sometimes challenging because everyone's really busy, and I think that that's a you know that's a that's a barrier. You know, you're busy working with one attending on one day, and then you're going to be scheduled with another attending on the next day. And you know, the way that our services are set up right now, where you're not necessarily seeing these the patients in the clinic. You're not having a chance to really, really review them. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about uh, how you how residents may improve their ability to, or how the system may improve the residents' ability to um, actually talk about cases before the day of. I think one of the things that I've noticed in another department, of urology, they sort of have an apprenticeship model, where they are with one attending for the entire month, uh, or maybe it's a week at a time, but that way you work very closely with that one attending and you can discuss all the cases that you have prepared for the, the month um, and you get to know them a lot uh, more closely. And I think something like that could be beneficial, um, but it would be very difficult to implement uh, in our current Dr. Cook, first curriculum. Yeah, I, I never thought I would come to Grand Rounds and have a triggering event. Um, <laughs> so um, it, it, it's interesting. So as, as Dr. Mel pointed out, um, uh, those two services, the the uh, like the East West service uh, or the Chief Resident Service um, and Minor Surge has been around for like over seventy years. Uh, it was disbanded uh, after I was there. Um, no correlation, but it was, it, it, it was disbanded after I was there, not because of outcomes, uh, but because of finances, right? All those, none of those cases were captured uh, for billing purposes because we were residents. There was no, there was no uh, attend, quote unquote attending. The, the, the quote unquote chief resident then became sort of a, a lecturer and then some of those cases were captured. Um, and you know, there's some issues with, with faculty um, uh, salary structure where some of the established faculty were looking at their RVUs and saying, you know, why aren't this hernia coming to me or this gallbladder coming to me? And then next thing you know, the, the services disappeared. Um, but, but that being said, um, looking back is interesting. While I was experiencing it, I was just terrified as a trainee being unsupervised in the OR or unsupervised in minor surge in the ER. As a faculty member now, looking back, I'm horrified uh, at the level of autonomy uh, that I had. But then the, the key about MGH at the time is that m ms was very transparent and very um, uh, open, so even for that service. And the outcomes uh, intuitively were the same and in many respects as we thought were as good if not better than some of the other outcomes off that service and then it's interesting that that data confirms that the, the other thing is is that you it, it changes your perspective in regards to how you carry yourself um, for instance minor surge you ran a clinic as an intern and when I first started that clinic you know I was running around you know my scrubs were untucked uh, my white coat was was changed, and one of the nurses came up to me and said, "You are the physician in this clinic. That patient there says she doesn't want to be seen by you because you look disheveled and you look flustered. You have to change your approach for these patients." And I was an intern, and that I, I remember that so clearly. That has served as a foundation for my entire career moving forward in terms of how my patients perceive me. Um, and that lesson was learned not as a first year faculty member, but that lesson was learned as an intern. Dr. Sanders, 
powder, and then we'll go to the city. We have a couple questions online. The first is from Carl Bayer. <clears throat> Great talk, Cole. It seems a lot of these interventions, i.e. chief resident, run services, etc., are targeted for academic medical centers. We rotate a lot at other types of hospitals, Kaiser, Barton, etc. Are there any interventions that work best in more private practice environments? Ooh, that's a good question. I think uh, as uh, Dr. Cook stated it might be difficult in the private practice private practice segments um, when you're talking about reimbursement because obviously that's how the surgeons in private practice are um, generating their income and if they're not getting uh, reimbursed for those procedures um, it will be very difficult for them to have the chiefs do a lot of those cases. We've looked at um, using the apprentice model in uh, more of these environments, particularly the Bay. We've talked about that a couple of times. And this is, it's timely because this is going to be one of the topics for the faculty in terms of next year and sort of reevaluating all of our education programs. And the second question comes from Dr. Pevic. <laughs> 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 How does a resident achieve autonomy on less frequent, more complex procedures? The proposed model works for simpler, more common procedures. That is also an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the difficulty is uh, maybe shifting our mindset from going to completely complete independence after, after practice because even with these more complex procedures, say, you know, the open thoracal abdominal aneurysm repairs, it's not a one attending case. There's two attendings in there, they, they have backup. There's a senior partner, and then there's a the junior faculty. And I think it's, again, a similar paradigm where you have someone there for, for guidance and, and assistance. Um, and to think that every resident will be able to do these complex procedures once they become a, an attending after five years is, is maybe not the answer. All right. One, I guess two, two last questions and comments. Go ahead. Go ahead. You might not know the answer to this one, but is there any uh, changes in the medical legal world regarding this? I mean, they just made video chats the same cost as an inpatient chat. Can they change, do the same thing for a resident kind of involvement? I don't think there's anything in the works to have the residents be able to build the same level as attending. If anything, it's probably going to go the opposite, opposite way, and there will probably be some sort of uh, legislation that makes the attending be present until the incision is closed and the patient's extubated, <laughs> just based on this current environment. That was a that was a great talk, Cole. I um. I was hoping, I, I missed a minute or two in the middle there, so maybe you talked about this, but I was hoping you could comment a bit about um, the role for competency-based versus time-based uh, training and entrustable professional activities uh, for the way forward, because a lot of people are kind of leaning on these ideas or, or pioneering them anyway. I, I didn't look into those things, time-based versus competency-based, but is that more for the resident educational curriculum? Well, some places are doing it at undergrad, but um, there are even places trying to work on doing it for residency, which basically um, it, it is what it sounds like. Instead of uh, completing a residency over X number of clinical years, like five years for general surgery, it's more um, you can do it in four, you can do it in six. It's a matter of when you accomplish various milestones. Some of you might be. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the, the concept of entrustable professional activities kind of ties in with that in that um, once a, a learner is signed off on doing a certain thing, like say a uh, cholecystectomy, mm -hmm. um, then they're allowed to just do that thing on their own and maybe even potentially bill for it, speaking to Dr. Ramadan's comment. Let, let me 
me uh, let Dr. Ferris, who's our education fellow, speak to this. I've been thinking about this a lot. Oh, okay. So uh, I'll start with thank you both for that presentation and for sparking this discussion and for bringing sort of the data and the information to all of us. Uh, one of the things I want to speak a comment on is we're actually piloting a new operative feedback process on FMG and Solar X as well. So we just know you guys were working on a similar thing. We had such a doctor who was to talk about options. So we're using the OKRS, which is another rating scale um, that's been developed out of Southern Illinois University. In fact, it was recommended now for the board to do those operative Thank you very much. We wish you all the best uh, returning home to Hawaii, and I'm sure everyone is going to want to come visit. <laughs> Thank you.